David and I that summer cut trails on the survey. All week in the valley for wages, in air that was steeped in the wail of mosquitoes, but over the sun-alive weekends we climbed to get from the ruck of camp, the surly poker, the wrangling, the snoring under fetid tents, and because we had joy in our lengthening coltish muscles and mountains for David were made to see over, stairs from the valleys and steps to the sun's retreats. Our first was Mount Gleam. We hiked in the long afternoon to a curling lake and lost the lure of the faceted cone in the swell of its sprawling shoulders. Past the inlet we grilled our bacon, the strips festooned on a poplar prong in the hurrying slant of the sunset. And then the two of us rolled in the blanket while round us the cold pines thrust at the stars. The dawn was a floating of mist till we reached into the slopes above timber and one to snow like fire in the sunlight. The peak was up thrust like a fist in a frozen ocean of rock that swirled into valleys the moon could be rolled in. Remotely unfurling eastward, the alien prairie glittered. Down through the dusty scree on the west we descended, and David showed me how to use the give of shale for incredible giant strides. I remember before the larch's edge that I jumped on a long green surf of juniper flowing away from the wind and landed in gentian and saxifrage spilled on the moss. Then the darkening firs and the sudden whirring of water that knifed down a fern-hidden cliff and splashed unseen into mist in the shadows. One Sunday on Rampart's Arate, a rain squall caught us and passed, and we clung by our bluing fingers and boot nails an endless hour in the sun, not daring to move till the ice had steamed from the slate. And David taught me time on a knife edge can pass with the guessing of fragments remembered from poets, the naming of strata beside one, and matching of stories from school days. We crawled astride the peak to feast on the marching ranges flagged by the fading shreds of the shattered storm cloud. Lingering there, it was David who spied to the south, remote and unmapped, a sunlit spire and sawback, an overhang crooked like a talon. David named it the finger. That day we chanced on the skull and the splayed white ribs of a mountain goat underneath a cliff face caught tight on a rock. Around were the silken feathers of kites. And that was the first time I knew that a goat could slip. And then, Inglis Maldi. Now I remember only the long ascent of the lonely valley, the live pine spirally scarred by lightning, the slicing pipe of invisible pica, and great prints by the lowest snow of a grizzly. There it was too that David taught me to read the scroll of coral in limestone and the beetle seal in the shade of ghostly trilobites, letters delivered to man from the Cambrian waves. On Sundance we tried from the call and the going was hard. The air howled from our feet to the smudged rocks in the papery lake below. At an outthrust we balked till David clung with his left to a dint in the scarp, lobbed the ice axe over the rocky lip, slipped from his holds and hung by the quivering pick, twisted his long legs into space and kicked to the crest. Then grinning, he reached down with his freckled wrist and drew me up after. We set a new time for that climb. That day returning we found a robin gyrating in grass, wing broken. I caught it to tame, but David took it and killed it and said, Could you teach it to fly? In August, the second attempt, we ascended the fortress. By the forks of the spray, we caught five trout and fried them over a balsam fire. The woods were alive with the vaulting of mule deer and drenched with clouds all the morning till we burst at noon to the flashing and floating round of the peaks. Coming down, we picked in our hats the bright and sun-hot raspberries, eating them under a mighty spruce while a marten, moving like quicksilver, scouted us. But always we talked of the finger on sawback, unknown and hooked. Till the first afternoon in September, we slogged through the musky woods past a swamp that quivered with frog song and camped by a bottle green lake. But under the cold breath of the glacier, sleep would not come, the moonlight etching the finger. We rose and trod past the feathery larch while the stars went out and the quiet heather flushed and the skyline pulsed with the surging bloom of incredible dawn in the Rockies. David spotted bighorns across the moraine and sent them leaping with yodels. The ramparts redoubled and rolled to the peaks and the peaks to the sun. The ice in the morning thaw was a gurgling world of crystal and cold blue chasms and serex that shone like frozen salt green waves. At the base of the finger we tried once and failed. Then David edged to the west and discovered the chimney. The last hundred feet we fought the rock and shouldered and kneed our way for an hour and made it. Unroping, we formed a cairn on the rotting tip. And then I turned to look north at the glistening wedge of giant Assiniboine, heedless of handhold. And one foot gave. I swayed and shouted. 
David turned sharp and reached out his arm and steadied me, turning again with a grin and his lips ready to jest. But the strain crumbled his foothold. Without a gasp, he was gone. I froze to the sound of grating edge nails and fingers, the slither of stones, the lone second of silence, the nightmare thud. Then only the wind and the muted beat of unknowing cascades. Somehow I worked down the fifty impossible feet to the ledge, calling and getting no answer but echoes released in the cirque, and trying not to reflect what an answer would mean. He lay still, with his lean young face upturned and strangely unmarred, but his legs splayed beneath him beside the final drop, six hundred feet sheer to the ice. My throat stopped when I reached him, for he was alive. He opened his grey straight eyes and brokenly murmured, over. Over. And I, feeling beneath him a cruel fang of the ledge thrust in his back but not understanding, mumbled stupidly, best not to move, and spoke of his pain. But he said, I can't move. If only I felt some pain. Then my shame stung the tears to my eyes as I crouched and I cursed myself, but he cried louder, No, Bobby. Don't ever blame yourself. I didn't test my foothold. He shut the lids of his eyes to the stare of the sky while I moistened his lips with our water flask and tearing my shirt into strips I swabbed the shredded hands. But blood slid from his side and stained the stone and the thirsting lichens and yet I dared not lift him up from the gore of the rock. Then he whispered, Bob, I want to go over. This time I knew what he meant, and I grasped for a lie and said, I'll be back by midnight with ropes and men from camp, and we'll cradle you out. But I knew that the day and the night must pass, and the cold dews of another morning before such men, unknowing the ways of mountains, could win to the chimney's top. And then how long? And he knew. And the hell of hours after that, if he lived till we came, roping him out? But I curled beside him and whispered, the bleeding will stop. You can last. He said only, Perhaps. For what? A wheelchair, Bob? His eyes brightening with fever upbraided me. I could not look at him more and said, Then I'll stay with you. But he did not speak for the clouding fever. I lay dazed and stared at the long valley the glistening hair of a creek on the rug stretched by the firs while the sun leaned round and flooded the ledge, the moss, and David, still as a broken doll. I hunched to my knees to leave, but he called, and his voice now was sharpened with fear. For Christ's sake, push me over, if I could move or die. The sweat ran from his forehead, but only his hair moved. A kite was buoying blackly its wings over the wrinkled ice. The purr of a waterfall rose and sank with the wind. Above us climbed the last joint of the finger, beckoning bleakly the wide, indifferent sky. Even then in the sun it grew cold lying there. And I knew he had tested his holds. It was I who had not. I looked at the blood on the ledge in the far valley. I looked at last in his eyes. He breathed. I'd do it for you, Bob. I will not remember how nor why I could twist up the wind-deviled peak and down through the chimney's empty horror and over the traverse alone. I remember only the pounding fear I would stumble on it when I came to the cold grave maw of the Berg Schrund, reeling over the sun-cankered snow bridge, shying the caves and the neve, the fear and the need to make sure it was there on the ice. The running and falling and running, leaping of gaping, green-throated crevasses, alone and pursued by the finger's lengthening shadow. At last, through the fanged and blinding serex, I slid to the milky, wrangling falls of the glacier's snout, through the rocks piled huge on the humped moraine and into the spectral larches, alone. By the glooming lake I sank and chilled my mouth, but I could not rest and stumbled still to the valley, losing my way in the ragged marsh. I was glad of the mire that covered the stains of my ripped boots, of his blood. But panic was on me, the reek of the bog, the purple glimmer of toadstools obscene in the twilight. 
I staggered clear to a fire waste, tripped, and fell with a shriek on my shoulder. It somehow eased my heart to know I was hurt, but I did not faint and I could not stop while over me hung the range of the sawback. In blackness I searched for the trail by the creek and found it. My feet squelched a slug and horror rose again in my nostrils. I hurled myself down the path. In the woods behind me some animal yelped. Then I saw the glimmer of tents and babbled my story. I said that he fell straight to the ice where they found him, and none but the sun and incurious clouds have lingered around the marks of that day on the ledge of the finger. That day, the last of my youth, on the last of our mountains.